Welcome to episode 36 of the reading of Michael McCoy's Garden. And I kind of I realized that over the last couple of days readings, I have painted my opening in a somewhat, um, not so much a negative light, but with real reservations about it. And I, I'm probably out of balance with that. There was this huge sense of anticipation, of course, and it was really fun to have the garden scheme on board. And they confessed to me that they used to do occasional drive-bys along the front to see if this garden was ever going to be ready. Because you'll remember that they pressed the print button on their guidebook the February before, uh, promising this opening when there was nothing to see at all. So they were taking a big risk themselves. And a week before the opening, a few of the committee members came to check out the garden. And I remember sending them round the back. I said, look, you guys go round the back. I don't really much like showing the garden, like showing people round. So I said, you go out the back, I'll bring out a drinks tray and I'll see you out there soon. And I remember appearing around the corner with this tray and the coordinator of the garden scheme just standing in the gravel garden with her eyes wide open and this big grin just going, Michael, it's fantastic. So you can imagine what a boost that was to me at the time. I'd been, you know, head down and tail up for 15 months in total and was delighted myself with the end result, but really had not yet had anybody else's response from it. So to go back to our reading, the garden opening is now over. And uh, the last reading I was anticipating the day, I wrote it on the morning of the opening and it was a weekend opening. And there were 1200 visitors over that weekend into our little quarter acre garden. So this is now the follow up. The 22nd of February, 1999. It's over. The opening has come and gone and I can relax. It seems after the last entry that I've left myself with two opposing ideas on how to judge the success of such an event. Certainly people were very complimentary, but then garden visitors tend to be of the kind sort. There were those who asked endless questions about plants. And then there were those who did not necessarily speak to me, but stayed for ages often appearing and disappearing here and there, standing in one spot for ages, suddenly moving on, then returning to the same point, just gazing. I think it's by this group that I gauge my success. Despite the crowds of people, which cannot help but detrimentally affect the atmosphere you've worked so hard to create in the garden, yet strangely creating another, not that much less attractive, these visitors are tuning into another level discovering the very place you have created, which is much more complex than any flowers within it. With these people, you share your garden. To most, you show it. The question now arises, can I claim this garden back as my own? 23rd of February, 1999. So this is two days after the opening. The garden opening was on a weekend and I, this must be Tuesday morning. A fortnight or so ago, I wandered past my clump of sedum Vera Jamison. I'm enjoying it more than ever before with the pale gravel for a background and wondered if the Zephyranthes candida, flower of the wind, about which the sedum spills, might be in flower for the open day. The sedum in bloom is quite sparse around the edges of the clump, so I placed the Zephyranthes at its perimeter with the thought that its white, crocus-like flowers might play amongst the rather quiet pink of the sedums. Then two days before the opening, I saw the buds, which were then cheerfully in bloom for the perfect weather we had on the open weekend. I couldn't believe it. That sort of thing never works out for me. Having said that, I think only one of the 1200 visitors even noticed them. The other thing I had mildly hoped for was the first flower of the Ipomoea tricolor heavenly blue. The throwback seedling, which I've called Purgatory Pink, has been flowering its head off for ages, and I'd hoped to be able to demonstrate the superiority of its parent. Then yesterday I went to pull out what I thought was a blue plastic shopping bag from the base of my trellis and found that it was the first two blooms of the morning glory. I'm in love again.
The other extraordinary stroke of luck was that the Joe Pye weed, Eupatorium gateway, was at its very best. This plant is superb from the moment it rises out of the ground, but reaches a climax when in bud, through until about the point when half of its flowers are open. Since much of the richness of colour comes from the dark buds, it starts to lose it a little when the flower head is in full bloom, and certainly when the first flowers start to brown. It's still a brilliant plant, but it's just past its best. It was perfection over the weekend, and was probably the most asked about plant in the garden. Second place goes to the orange Cosmos, Cosmos sulfurius. Every time I answered that it was a Cosmos, the inquirer would step over to the plant saying, no, I mean this, and I'd say, yes, I mean that, and they'd say, this, a Cosmos? It was the same every time, until I began to suspect that Karen was handing out scripts at the front gate. The third place goes to the purple Tradescantia pallida purpurea. I remember it in my grandmother's dingy shade house, I think she called it a fernery, long after she'd passed away, growing in a brittle white plastic pot in hard garden soil that would shrink back from the edges when dry. Some visitors had similar memories, but most had never seen the plant before. So my memories of that weekend are of just such an amazing and happy but crazy busy time. I mean, it was kind of, it was bumper to bumper um, for most of the peak times over the, what is it, about six and a half hours a day that it's open. And uh, there, there was virtually no damage. The lawns, of course, were a bit squashed. But I remember speaking to Dame Elizabeth Murdoch when um, a few years after she'd had her garden open to the public for the first time for the Australian Open Garden Scheme. It was about 1988, I think. And it was open between 4 p.m. and 9 p.m. And there were 7,000 people through Cruden Farm during that time. And I remember just seeing all of the ajuga and the, uh, the baby's tears daisy squashed absolutely flat in the stone steps and thinking, oh, how sad that, it, that this number of people sustains this damage. Anyway, some years later, I was having lunch with Dame Elizabeth and I was asking her about that day and she was saying, oh, it was a terrible day, terrible day. She said, I'll never do it like that again. I'll never open it like that again. I said, oh, yes, it must have been terrible to see the damage following the, the opening. And she said, oh, no, that wasn't the point at all. The, the garden bounced back very quickly. She said it was just such a shame that nobody got to experience it in the way they should experience it, that with 7,000 people here, that no one really got the feeling of the garden. And that's what she was sad about, not the damage sustained by the garden, which was just so Dame Elizabeth. She was such an amazingly generous and giving person. So a huge shout out to anyone who's opened their garden before, to charity or uh, to the garden scheme. It's a really big deal, but it's such a great way for us to share our own learnings, our own journey, our own line of inquiry, I guess. It was such an enriching experience for me and possibly best of all, it gave me a massive deadline and I reached that deadline. And then we had several years after of just enjoying the fruits of that labor.